Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for stopping by. I want to start off by saying that I am very much aware that everyone is interested in Amber's testimony at the moment because she is currently testifying and people want me to talk about it. Just please bear in mind that she is not finished with her testimony yet. So I want to wait until she's done in order to make a comprehensive video about her evidence rather than just giving you tidbits here and there. I will be sharing a few of my opinions about her testimony so far at the end of this video. If you haven't watched parts one and two of this video series, I do highly suggest that you do. I'm covering all of the witness testimony in chronological order. I think I did swap out Kate James with Kevin Murphy because people really wanted to hear my opinion about the fact that Amber may have stolen Kate James's sexual assault story. But like I said, I do want this to be as chronological as possible. I'm sure you can all agree that Johnny's evidence is incredibly important just as important as Amber's in this case, and I want to shine light on it. I don't just want to throw it by the wayside and talk about Amber because that's just what's hot right now. All right, so the first witness for today is Mr. Kevin Murphy, who used to be the estate manager for Johnny Depp's penthouses and his other properties as well. However, he stopped working for Johnny in 2016. Mr. Murphy is yet another witness whose evidence we have discussed in great detail in my rebuttal videos. So I will be just summarizing the gist of his evidence for this video. However, as per usual, we're going to be looking at his testimony during the trial in more detail. So in summary, Mr. Murphy has never seen Johnny being physically violent or aggressive towards Amber Heard or anyone. In fact, he frequently witnessed Amber yelling at Johnny and being verbally abusive towards him. And at one point, he was called up by Johnny to replace a remote control, and he saw that there was a fresh laceration on Johnny's forehead, where Amber had thrown the remote control at Johnny's face with such excessive force that it broke. Mr. Murphy is also a witness on two key dates, the 16th of December 2015 and the 22nd of April 2016. On the 16th of December, a day after Amber alleges to have been assaulted by Johnny, Mr. Murphy testified to having seen Amber with no injuries or bruises to her scalp or her face or her body. He was called up by Hilda Vargas, who we discussed in part two, about the feces that was left on Johnny's side of the bed. Mr. Murphy also provided evidence of Amber lying to the Australian government with regards to illegally smuggling in her dogs and coercing Mr. Murphy to lie on her behalf. And finally, in his second witness statement, he provided evidence that Savannah McMillan was indeed Amber Heard's assistant and not her friend and was working for Amber illegally in the US. Now, if you'll remember, Amber had lied to the US government, alleging that Miss McMillan, Savannah McMillan, not Samantha McMillan, the stylist, was Amber's friend, not her assistant. So right from the get-go, Ms. Swass attempted to discredit Mr. Murphy by stating that he wasn't close to the couple and therefore he wasn't around them all the time, so he has no insight into the context of their arguments or even of the dynamic of their relationship. As with all the other witnesses that we have discussed so far, Ms. Swass was intent on painting Mr. Murphy as a liar. She went as far as to say that it was actually Johnny's lawyer, Marty Singer, in addition to Johnny himself and Kevin, who were responsible for the dog incident in Australia. Ms. Wass further claimed that Amber never threatened Mr. Murphy and that he lied to the Australian government of his own accord and that he intentionally left out that fact in his first witness statement to mislead the court. So Ms. Wass relied on the fact that Mr. Murphy lied for Amber in the Australian court proceedings as proof that he does not hesitate to commit perjury. She also played back her favorite video, I would assume, of Johnny slamming kitchen cabinets. As she did with the other witnesses, she relied on the this video to contradict Mr. Murphy's description of Johnny of being a peaceful and kind person. I do have to say Mr. Murphy was quite spirited because he did point out to Miss Wass that Johnny was taking out his anger on kitchen cabinets, not people, which is an argument that Mr. Sherborne made sure to make every single time that TMZ video was played out in court. Miss Wass went on to call Mr. Murphy a liar with regards to the bruises and injuries that he did not see on Amber on the 16th of December 2015. He, of course, denied this and maintained his position. 
This testimony is of course in line with Samantha McMillan, who saw her on the 16th of December as well, and the nurse who personally examined Amber on the 17th of December, 2015. So we have three independent witnesses who have testified to the same thing. With regards to the feces incident on the 22nd of April, 2016, Miss Swass tried to implicate Johnny's dog, Boo, for being responsible for defecating on the bed, even though several witnesses, including Hilda Vargas, have maintained that firstly, the feces was far too large to come out of such a small dog, and secondly, the dogs couldn't even get on top of the bed without any assistance. I also find it interesting that Amber changed her story with regards to that incident so many times, and at one point, she maintained that it never happened, right? So she told Johnny he was imagining things, she told Hilda Vargas that she was imagining things. After telling Mr. Murphy on the 12th of May that it was a harmless prank she then changed her story on the 21st of May 2016 and told him that it never happened and yet NGN are arguing that the dog did it so which one is it did it never happen despite having photographs and various witness testimony or did the dog do it or was it a harmless prank these inconsistencies are highly problematic when it comes to the veracity of witness testimony and evidence in fact, if there is one word I can use to describe Johnny's case so far, it's consistency. So Mr. Murphy was incredibly straightforward with Miss Wass, and when Wass accused him of suggesting that Amber was conspiring against Johnny, Mr. Murphy's response was, well, I'm not suggesting. I think that it is a hoax. Finally, he outright denied conspiring against Amber with Johnny Depp and his US lawyer, Adam Waldman. So as per usual, Mr. Sherborne did re-examine Mr. Murphy on a number of things to re-establish his credibility. But there's really only one thing that's worth mentioning. Mr. Sherborne had Mr. Murphy clarified to the court that he stopped working for Johnny in 2016. So what Mr. Sherborne was doing was effectively demonstrating to the court that Mr. Murphy's loyalty did not lie with Johnny anymore. He didn't rely on him for work. He wasn't his boss and he hadn't worked for him for years at this point. So he has no motive or reason or any personal interest in lying for Johnny or covering for him, which is incredibly important because that is the only argument that Miss Wass keeps throwing at all of these witnesses so far. Once you get rid of that argument, which I think Mr. Sherborne does an incredibly good job of doing, it really paints them out to be credible and impartial witnesses who are just here to tell the truth. Moving on to Sean Bett, who has been a member of Johnny's security detail for nine or 14 years. I'm not sure. He says in his witness statement that it's nine years, but in his testimony, he corrects Miss Wass and says 14 years. Either way, he's worked for Johnny and his family for a long time. Contrary to what Miss Wass put to Officer Sainz, if you'll remember from part one, Sean Bett never worked for the LAPD. Rather, he worked for the LA County Sheriff's Department, which are two completely separate departments, even though sometimes they may work together. Mr. Bett testified that he was frequently with the couple, sometimes for five to seven days, and that he had never witnessed Johnny being violent or abusive towards Amber, and that Amber never complained to Mr. Bett about any abuse or mistreatment from Johnny. In fact, Mr. Bett states that it was Amber who was frequently the abusive one. He described it as a recurring vicious cycle of Amber abusing Johnny, and Johnny in turn would call security for assistance in removing himself from the situation. He also noticed how Amber was particularly abusive after consuming alcohol, which is very interesting because that is exactly what she is alleging against Johnny. After the incident of the 21st of April, 2016, Mr. Bett was there and he took photos of Johnny's injuries after extracting him from the altercation. However, there was a bit of a mix up with regards to this photo. It turns out that the photo provided as an exhibit to Mr. Bett's witness statement was actually taken on the 23rd of March, 2015, when Amber had punched Johnny because she apparently feared he would push Whitney, her sister, down the stairs. Mr. Bett was confused and thought that this was the photo that he took on the 21st of April because they looked so similar and it was a very similar type of injury. Mr. Bett conceded that this was his mistake and he reached out to Johnny's lawyers a few days before his testimony in this trial and informed them of this unfortunate hiccup. His explanation was that 
that he has changed many phones since the 21st of April and couldn't locate the photo that he took of Johnny that day. Now, of course, Miss Wass latched onto this and challenged his account of Johnny being physically abused by Amber that night and used a lack of photographic evidence as the basis for her argument. Mr. Bett denied this and maintained that Johnny was indeed physically assaulted and injured by Amber that night. He was just unfortunately unable to recover the photo. With regards to the 21st of May, the final fight that took place between the couple, Mr. Bett testified that Johnny was lucid and sober and apprehensive at how Amber would react once he arrived at the penthouse to talk to her about the feces and about the future of their relationship. He corroborates Johnny's evidence that Johnny was 20 feet away from Amber by the time she was yelling, stop hitting me, Johnny, because at that point, Mr. Bett and Mr. Judge came into the penthouse from where they were standing outside in the hallway. And he also testified that Amber seemed very taken aback when the security guards showed up and quickly changed what she was saying to, if you hit me one more time, I'm going to call the police. This is once again, completely in line with Johnny's testimony. As for the state of the apartment and Amber's injuries, Mr. Bett testified that there was nothing broken, no smashed glass, nothing was in disarray. And of course, most importantly, Amber was absolutely injury free. Miss Wass tried to argue that Sean Bett was Johnny's bodyguard, not Amber's. And therefore he didn't have that close association with her. His priority was Johnny and Amber wouldn't have felt comfortable enough to confide in him if Johnny had ever done anything to her. Mr. Bett countered this by saying that Amber had confided in him during the few times that he would drive her back home at Johnny's request if she was too upset to drive alone. She would cry, according to Mr. Bett, about how much she loved Johnny and how much she wanted things to work out with him. And never once did she insinuate or allege that she was ever abused by Johnny. So Mr. Sherborne took the opportunity to clear a few things up in re-examination, specifically with regards to the photo mix-up, because it can appear to the judge that it was an intentional attempt to mislead the court. Mr. Sherborne, once again, in an incredibly clever tactic, showed Mr. Bett photos of an injured Johnny that were taken by Mr. Bett on the 15th of December, 2015. This was done to demonstrate to the court that Mr. Bett was not lying about the 21st of April, 2016. It showed that Mr. Bett has a habit or a tendency to take photos of Johnny to document his injuries after his fights with Amber, whether this was on the 15th of December, on the 23rd of March, or the 21st of April, it's irrelevant. Once again, an overall good witness with consistent, credible evidence. Next, we have Mr. Starling Jenkins, who has worked for Johnny as a security guard since 1993. I want to make a quick mention here about how long a lot of these witnesses have known Johnny, either as friends or associates or employees. Most of these witnesses have known Johnny for far longer than a lot of us were even alive on this planet. And this is purely just based on my personal experiences, not from any legal or professional perspective, the fact that Johnny is able to maintain relationships for such a long period of time points to the fact that he is a very pleasant person to be around because problematic people, from my experience, have a lot of problems with holding on to relationships and friendships. They tend to go through friends and groups like changing clothes. Mr. Jenkins also testified to having never seen Johnny being violent or abusive towards anyone, including Amber Heard. He also testified to having never seen any injuries on Amber. Mr. Jenkins' testimony is mostly relevant to the 22nd of April, 2016, as he was the person who drove Amber and her group of friends to the Coachella Music Festival. Specifically, he stated how he heard Amber frequently express how angry she was at Johnny for being late to her birthday party dinner, but never once did she allude or hint or insinuate or mention in any capacity that she was physically abused by him that night or at any other time for that matter. 
This was an incredibly short cross-examination. Miss Wass really held on to the argument that Mr. Jenkins was confused about who was vomiting in the car park that day. I'm assuming because he was alleging Amber was incredibly high, so she was under the influence. And Miss Wass tried to argue that it was actually Whitney who was vomiting in the car park, but Mr. Jenkins maintained that he knew exactly who Amber was. Whitney and Amber are not twins. He doesn't mistake one for the other. In re-examination, Mr. Sherborne did provide Mr. Jenkins with the opportunity to back up his assertion that it was Amber who was vomiting when he presented him with a photograph and Mr. Jenkins was able to immediately identify Amber in the white dress because he did state to Miss Wass that the person who was vomiting, even though she had her back to him, was wearing a white dress. All right, second last witness for today, Mr. Isaac Baruch. Now, I didn't even know how to pronounce his surname, but in the transcripts, he actually is asked to pronounce it, and then they've very helpfully written it out as Baruch. So if anyone thinks I'm mispronouncing it, that's how Mr. Baruch himself directed the court to refer to him. So just so we get that clear. So Mr. Baruch has been friends with Johnny for nearly 40 years. Mr. Baruch also lived at the Eastern Columbia building as Johnny and Amber's neighbor on the penthouse level. He testified to having frequently interacted with them and Amber's friends, so Raquel Pennington and Josh Drew, and that he loved them all. So we actually talked about Mr. Baruch in my rebuttal of Amber Heard's evidence video part two. So again, we're not gonna go through his evidence in any detail. In general, he testified to having seen Amber multiple times between the 22nd of May, 2016 and the 27th of May, 2016. And these were proper conversations, face to face in very good lighting, so it's not like they were just passing each other by in the hallway and you know they said hi to each other. He had the opportunity to very closely examine her face. And if you've already watched that video of mine, you will know that he testified to having seen her completely makeup free, and he was adamant on that, and absolutely injury free. In fact, he testified to having a conversation with Amber on the 22nd of May around midday, so less than 24 hours after she was allegedly bashed in the face with a phone. And she actually was stretching out her face, the right side of her face, and pointing at her cheek to Mr. Baruch, asking him if he can see the bruise. And Mr. Baruch just stood there going, I don't see anything. So Miss Wass's argument was that Amber was actually headed out to a birthday party that day, which she was, we even have a photo of it, and that she must have been made up because she was going to a party. Mr. Baruch denied this and maintained that she was absolutely makeup free. And it's very easy to believe Mr. Baruch because they were having all of these conversations in the building, so where they lived, at home. It's not like they met outside in the street or in a party or some public place. So Miss Wass's argument, even if you were inclined to believe it, isn't even applicable in this situation. So from the very beginning of her cross-examination of Mr. Baruch, Miss Wass tried to paint him as this loyal friend of Johnny's who has borrowed a ton of money from Johnny that he hasn't even paid back yet. And to add to her argument of Mr. Baruch being a biased, lying witness, she questioned him on how he had always lived rent-free at Johnny's properties, etc., etc. Towards the end of his cross-examination, Mr. Baruch testified that Amber had invited him over for a meal on the 3rd of June, 2016, but he declined and told her that he didn't think, based on what was going on in, in the media, he didn't think it was a good idea for them to continue to associate. And finally, he testified that he had only ever seen Elon Musk at the Eastern Columbia building after the 21st of May, 2016, on two separate occasions, and that it was during the day. So in response to Wass's implication that Mr. Baruch is not someone to be trusted because he was really benefiting off of Johnny and therefore didn't want to get on his bad side, Mr. Sherborne asks Mr. Baruch to clarify two things. Was he the only person that Johnny loaned money to? And was he the only person who lived rent-free at Johnny's properties? Mr. Baruch responded that Johnny was an incredibly generous person and that he was definitely not the only person who was borrowing money off of him or who was receiving money. Mr. Sherborne then asked Mr. Baruch to identify who else was living rent-free at Johnny's property. In response, Mr. Baruch lists Raquel Pennington, Josh Drew, and Whitney Hurd, 
Amber's sister, as three people who have lived rent-free at Johnny's properties for a considerable amount of time. Now, what do these three people have in common? Raquel, Josh, and Whitney are all from Amber's side. So essentially the argument that Mr. Sherborne is trying to shoot down is that Mr. Baruch is profiting off Johnny, right? He's benefiting off of him and he wouldn't do anything to get on his bad side, which includes lying for him in court just to make sure that Johnny continues to spend money on him. Purely in terms of fairness, I do want to acknowledge that in a hypothetical or theoretical situation, this argument of someone benefiting off of someone else and therefore their willingness to lie for that person is based on that arrangement is a valid argument to make. But in this case, when you take everything into context, it is a weak argument because there are just so many people. Everyone is saying the same thing, whether they're benefiting off Johnny or not. It's also important to point out that men abusing women is really not tolerated by society. And I would like to assume that all of these witnesses are stand up people, good people who no matter what benefits they were receiving off of Johnny, such as employment or a place to live, wouldn't tolerate someone beating up their wife on such a consistent basis. That's what I'd like to think. I'm not saying everyone's decent. I'm not saying that everyone would stand up to an abusive person because I know people in my life who have condoned the actions of abusive people. But the odds of everyone who was involved in this case as a witness for Johnny being bad people and condoning this behavior are very low. Specifically when you look at people such as Sean Bett, people who can easily find employment outside of Johnny Depp. So it's not like he's the only working person in Hollywood. They really have no reason to cover for him if he was such an awful person. And finally, before we move on to our final witness, Mr. Sherborne asked Mr. Baruch to clarify whether he would have seen Elon Musk visiting Amber late at night, to which Mr. Baruch responded, no, he'd be in his own apartment at that time and he wouldn't know what was going on outside of it which is important because Ms. Wass was trying to point that Mr. Musk was visiting Amber during the day, so it was purely platonic, there's nothing untoward going on. But of course, just because no one saw him visiting late at night, and we're talking midnight, that doesn't mean he never did. Except someone did see him visiting late at night. And that's our next witness, Mr. Alejandro Romero. Now, if you'll remember from my rebuttal of Amber Heard's evidence video, Mr. Romero worked as a concierge at the Eastern Columbia building. We've already talked about how he witnessed Amber completely injury-free during the period leading up to the 27th of May, 2016, so we're not gonna talk about that here. And oddly enough, this wasn't even put to him at all during cross-examination. All Ms. Swass talked about in cross-examination was when Mr. Romero saw Elon Musk visiting Amber. So Mr. Romero did have the dates muddled up quite a bit. Initially, he testified to having seen Amber for the first time ever at the Eastern Columbia building in July of 2015. But then he also testified that Amber would frequently call him to allow Elon into the building, so to fob him up to the penthouse, in March of 2015. And he is absolutely certain that it was March 2015 because that was the time that Johnny's finger was freshly injured. And he specifically remembers this. We'll explain why when we get to re-examination. So Mr. Romero states that Elon Musk regularly visited Amber late at night at the Eastern Columbia building. So a year before divorce was even mentioned. And he specifically said that he would only visit her when Johnny was away. Eventually, instead of asking Mr. Romero to let Mr. Musk into the building, Amber ended up giving Mr. Musk a remote control for the garage and a fob for the penthouse apartment. So he can now effectively let himself into the building at free will. And this is a major thing to do, to give someone a copy of your keys and access to your home is a big step in a relationship. You don't just do it to anyone. So Miss Wass tried to argue that Mr. Romero had the dates all muddled up and that Amber actually moved into the Eastern Columbia building in March 2013, not 2016. And of course she did this in an attempt to show the court that he has no idea what he's talking about and that Mr. Musk never visited Amber in 2015. He conceded that he may have gotten the dates mixed up, but he's sure of two things. Firstly, that Amber moved into the apartment in 2016 because her name was never in the system 
prior to that. And he said that the way their building works is that if your name is not in the system, you are not recognized as a resident. So he has that factual evidence to back up his assertion that she moved in in March 2016. Secondly, in re-examination, Mr. Sherborne had him explain to the court why he was so certain that Mr. Elon Musk visited Amber in March of 2015 when Johnny's finger was injured. And his response to that was that he has a very good friend of his who was a musician and was very concerned that Johnny wouldn't be able to play the guitar at that time. So he gave the court this personal story and explanation as to why he insisted that it was March 2015. So it adds a lot of credibility to his assertion. All right, that's it for this video. Now, the next video will be out on Friday. We're gonna start with the testimony of Travis McGivern, who is Johnny's security guard as well. And we're gonna finish off with Johnny's side and Johnny's witnesses on Friday so that we can start off Monday, hopefully, with Amber's testimony. I do wanna let you know one thing about Amber's testimony right now, because I know everyone wants to hear it. She's not doing well. I don't wanna say this to get your hopes up, but her cross-examination is a disaster. She cannot, for the life of her, give a straight answer. She is basically saying that everyone else has it wrong. The police officers, the employees at the Eastern Columbia building, Hilda Vargas, everyone who contradicts her account has it wrong. Now she keeps saying, I don't wanna call anyone a liar, but that is obviously what she's insinuating. She's saying that everyone's lying, I'm telling the truth, believe me. I also wanna say that the lawyer who is cross-examining her, Miss Eleanor Laws, is doing an incredible job. Because Amber's performance does depend to some extent on how well the cross-examining lawyer is doing. So asking the right questions to portray her as a liar who is not credible which is incredibly important to do in Amber's case because her allegations are the entire foundation and basis of NGN's defense. That's all I'm gonna say about that for now. I've been getting a lot of comments asking me to comment on Amber's testimony. Please be patient. I do wanna wait until she is finished testifying until I make a video. I'm sure you'll all understand. As always, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe and I will catch you in a future video.